So we have come to this story that we know as the story of the prodigal son this morning. This story is nowhere in the Bible, nor by Jesus ever titled the story of the prodigal son. And probably never should have been, because it is not only the story of the prodigal, it is also, and no less, the story of the righteous son, and the story of a father. It is one of the great Christian stories of reconciliation. This story comes to us in the season of Lent when we are meant to be readying ourselves to take in the mystery and reality of the Easter event. Something about this story is meant to get us to the place of resurrection, to get us to Easter, which is the place we experience through Christ the possibility of the full, whole, and resurrected life. So the text for today announced that we cannot fully experience Easter. We cannot fully embrace Christ within ourselves without doing the work of reconciliation. Jesus never told a story randomly. His stories were always offered out of a response. The parable of the man and his two sons was Jesus' response to the Pharisees' outrage that he was welcoming the broken and the outcast, that he was dining with them all. That is the setup for the story of the father and the two sons. The Pharisees and scribes have no patience with Jesus. So the setup to the story in the gospel account is similar to a story a classic short story by Raymond Carver called Cathedral. In the story, a man called Bub is asked by his wife if he minds, if she, if he minds if an old friend of hers, a blind man called Robert, who has just lost his wife, if, if he came for a visit. Bub is irritated by the idea of a visit from a stranger that he will have to conjure up hospitality on his Saturday afternoon. But he doesn't see that he has much choice. How does he refuse a blind man? How does he refuse a man who has just lost his wife? He cannot possibly say no. So Robert arrives by train, and the wife picks him up and brings him to the house. And the three of them share a meal and conversation, and then they move to the den and to the television set. And the wife falls asleep on the sofa, leaving Bub and Robert to the television set. A documentary about cathedrals comes on the telly, and the two men sit and listen And then the voiceover ends, and the television just spans these gorgeous images with background music of cathedrals. Bub begins to feel a burden to describe the stunning architecture to Robert. He stumbles with his words. He owns that he is not a man of faith. He says he has no words to describe a cathedral. He can only offer this. In those olden days, Robert, when they built cathedrals, men wanted to be close to God. You can tell this by looking at a cathedral. People wanted to be close to God in them. He says, Bub, Bub says, Robert, I'm sorry. I just can't describe it any more than that. So Robert suggests that Bub gets a pen and a paper and draws a cathedral while Robert is holding his hand. So Bub does this. He starts to draw a cathedral with Robert's hand on top of his own as he draws. It's difficult because Bub is not a man who does much drawing. The blind man tells him, close your eyes, Bub. Are they closed, Robert says. Don't lie. They're closed, says Bub. Keep them that way. Don't stop now. Draw. Draw. 
The scribes and the Pharisees could not see the cathedral that Jesus was building when he was sitting with the outcasts and the sinners. So he tried to describe it to them in a story. It was a cathedral built of the bricks and mortars of reconciliation. There's a prodigal son and there is a righteous son. They travel two different roads. One is considered the high road. It is discriminating and righteous and it smells of privilege and superiority. The other is some darker alley. It is riotous and squandering and it smells of brokenness and inferiority. Both of the sons have traveled far down their road of choice. So far that perhaps it is beyond any part, any point of return. Hearing the stories, we certainly wonder if they can come back. But not the good father. He knows there is always a path of return. The father also knows this. Both his sons are living out of a limited position. Righteousness is as much of a trap as wantonness. Both his sons have to move from where they are entrenched to be reconciled, to arrive at the place of the father, which is to be finally and authentically at home. Our lives then are as whole as we are reconciled to one another. What is unreconciled in our own hearts and in the world is a compromise to our lives. So there's work of reconciliation that we put off, not because we don't have the skills to tend it, but because it is work to do it. To be vulnerable with another person, to be vulnerable in a situation, we have to get uncomfortable, we have to move into choppy waters. And we think it's not that big of a deal. Here's the thing. There's this work that if we would just get off our duff a little bit and give ourselves to it, show up to these little reconciliations, it does matter. It matters because the hard reconciliations that we have to do are built on the muscle of the little reconciliations that we do. It matters that we apologize when we, you know, shut the door on someone. These little reconciliations, these little dignities we can extend one another help us, ready us for the larger dignities we need to find in ourselves for one another. We cannot turn on the news without recognizing how difficult, if impossible, it seems in some situations that we will be reconciled. And we all know, we all know, not for the father to embrace the son, but for the brothers to embrace one another. There are situations in which we are sure reconciliation is next to impossible. I have my list. Some of it is personal and some of it's out there, and I share it with you. Here's what I've come to. In this moment in time, I may not can reconcile myself to a person and to some situations. To some that have done me harm, harm someone I love. And there are situations in the world that as Christian people, we cannot reconcile ourselves to. I will not be reconciled to the traumatizing of children. I will not be reconciled to a world with refugees risking their lives for safety. To an economic system in which five billionaires own as much wealth as half the global population. To the unjust incarceration of African American men, to one species destroying the natural world. 
Our faith does not call us to reconcile ourselves with injustice or practitioners of it, to swallow down hate and bigotry for the cause of unity. Nor are we allowed to take the high road into the sunset. The father in the story, story saw something the brothers could not see. The father was reconciled to a possibility beyond the evidence of his wayward son or his righteous son. We are Christians. We are to be reconciled to the Christ in each one, in each person, in each moment, which means our eye is on a reconciliation we may not can see. We are asked to commit ourselves not not to a road, but to an unmapped territory, to a new way of being, to a reconciliation we have to close our eyes to find. People come to the Episcopal Church from Protestant, more Protestant traditions and remark over all the ritual. It can feel so formal. And those of us entrenched in this tradition sometimes can feel it's too tight and we push. But here's the gift of our ritual. What we cannot manifest in the world, we can perform spiritually at this table. Our ritual, this table that we gather around, demonstrates another reality. And we do it again and again and again at this table, sharing bread and the common cup. Being at this table gives us the wisdom to remain at the impossible tables in the world. We say this, how we pray shapes what we believe. Our rituals define us. They shape our souls into a love bigger than what we believe we can hold. Nelson Mandela came from 27 years in prison and asked, who have we yet to bring into the field of our affections? I know that if we peel back enough layers of even the most calloused heart, we will finally come to a point of compassion. Our faith asks us to hold on for the imago dei, the image of God in our righteous brother and in our wanton brother. We are Christians. We are progressives and we are conservatives. And not a one of us gets very far in the work of reconciliation by standing in our own place. Jesus calls us to stand with others, not from our place, but as if we were in the other's place. Jesus looked around and said, we've got to move. And then he sat down with the outcast. Michael and I, I think I might have told you this, um, have friends that own a vitamin supplement company. And when you're with Mitchell at a gathering in Ev and they find out he owns a supplement company, inevitably someone asked him, if I just take one supplement, Mitchell, what should I take? And Mitchell shakes his head and he said, if you're going to do one thing for your health, move your body. Move. Take a step. Sometimes, like the father, we have it in us to run for the wayward son. But the biggest steps, of course, aren't out there, but they're inside of us. It's the movement of staying present when it's easier to walk away. Lila June Johnson is an indigenous water protector and was active in the struggle at Standing Rock. She stood her ground. She didn't move at Standing Rock. But she walked a mile in the direction of reconciliation. So these are her words. How could such a pitiful person like me, who received the most beautiful gift of forgiveness, deny that to other people? 
I would rather give them that same unconditional love and liberation that comes from being reassumed into the sacred family of creation despite our innumerable flaws. We must give harmful people a way out unless we truly want to live stuck in this cycle forever. We must give those that live outside of love and truth an opportunity to come back home in our every interaction with them. They may not accept it, but it is our job to offer it. And we must not reinforce the illusion that the sons and daughters of humanity are our enemies. We must meet that assertion with our own assertion, the truth that the sons and daughters of humanity were meant to live as family. So yes, when policemen come up to my face and point, point a barrel to my chest, I will not hate them. They are living a lie that we are competing enemies. I will not engage this lie and treat them as enemies in return. I will negate and dispel this lie by looking them into the eyes and reminding them of the truth. We are family. This is the only way to bring the world back to reality. Beyond our own ritual, we also have the scaffolding of our own lives. I believe if we listen well and if we are very brave, that scaffolding will lead us home. Our lives are our spiritual material, and so the very thing that we think might kill us might be the very thing that will save us. So there is a reconciliation we must make to our own lives with what is that presents in who we are and where we are and our time and place. Some of it will break our heart open, open. We must stay at the table of our own lives. We must do reconciliation with our own lives. I am here to tell you that you have a choice and many people choose not to mine what rises in their own lives. It is so easy to take what is hard and put it over there. But if we cannot be reconciled to our own lives, we will only limp toward the work of reconciliation with one another. We have to stay at the table of our own life and believe until we experience God in the mix. In Raymond Carver's story, Bub had to close his eyes to make a cathedral. While they were drawing, Bub with the pencil and the blind man's hand over his, the blind man commented, I know this about cathedrals. Generations of the same families worked on a cathedral. The men who began their life's work on them never lived to see the completion of their work. And then their sons came and worked on the cathedral. And they never saw the completion of their work. In that way, Bub, they're no different from the rest of us, right? Right? We are building a cathedral of love in this world, one brick at a time. We may not see the final spire, but stacking one brick, that is all our work is. That brings us home to the good father who is there and the table is set and dinner is waiting. Amen.